studied together and we are going into Galatians chapter 3. I'm really excited. This is a huge chapter, one that has you know, a long history of many people discussing what it is that it says and doesn't say. I'll have to admit, I don't read everything everybody writes about a subject. I try to stick to the Bible and other inspired writings, which I believe are found in the writings of Sister White. And so when I am sharing, I'm going to be sharing from the perspective that I've come from. That doesn't mean it's right necessarily, but it is an honest approach, I'll tell you that. And so going into this chapter, I, it's probably going to be two parts, but uh, I look with interest to hear your comments and your thoughts, so feel free to share. But it says here, O foolish Galatians. Now, the word foolish, we should probably take a look at it. It is a negative, of course. And it's a derivative of this word. I'm not going to look at it now, but it's unintelligent. Somebody by implication is sensual. So foolish or unwise. And so you unwise or you unintelligent Galatians. That's a nice way to start off a chapter, right? <laughs> Paul sometimes was very forward. So, you foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you? Now, this phrase, bewitched, I'm going to double-click or triple-click that. To malign somebody who to is fascinated you. Who fascinated you by false representations? Who caught your attention? And so, you Galatians, you're foolish, you're bewitched. Paul, settle down a little bit, right? No, not really, because he's very strong in the fact that he has preached the truth to them, and they have gone astray from it. So remember, we talked about that in chapter 1 and 2. O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you that you should not obey the truth? Now, where do we know about truth? Well, truth comes from the Word of God, through his prophets, and we know that God sent his Son, who had the Spirit of truth. So really, if we reject truth, we're reje rejecting the Son of God. And so these Galatians have been bewitched, they're foolish, and they're not obeying the truth. So if you're not obeying the truth, what are you obeying? Lies, right? So then who's your father? The father of lies. So really, obedience matters, doesn't it? Obedience matters in such a way that we will define who is our God based on what we're doing, who we're obeying, either self or Satan, or the father and his son. So it's, you've come to the point where you're not obeying the truth, okay? Before whose eyes Jesus Christ has been evidently set before, or set forth, crucified among you. So what is this evidently set forth? Like, are you saying that Christ was actually crucified in the front of the Galatians, like they were there? Well, not really. But he, Christ was evidently set forth, crucified among you. So what does this mean? I'm going to triple click this word. See, um, hath been evidently set forth is all summed up in this one word, forth. Okay, so the word Christ is there and then forth. So I'm going to triple click forth and we're going to see to write previously, to announce or prescribe, before ordain, evidently set forth, to write a four or a four times. So this word doesn't come up very often. Basically what it's saying is, that I have written about this before. You heard about this through my writing. So Jesus Christ has been evidently set forth before you. He's been crucified. I, I wrote to you about it. And it was among you. You all saw it. So it's, I think it's kind of interesting how that when Christ has sent a message to you, if God has sent a message to you, and you have been able to hear, if that message is truth, then... It sounds to me like you will be held accountable as though it has been evidently set before you. Like even nature in Romans chapter 1 makes it clear that, or God makes it clear through nature, that his eternal power and Godhead has been given unto us, revealed in nature so that we are without excuse. And so God's power and Godhead has been evidently set forth before us, even in nature. So I think this is really fascinating how we can see here that we've got this message that's talking about how 
the Christ, Jesus Christ, has been evidently set forth. But when you're looking at it in the original language, it really means, I've written about this before. And as a result, Christ is crucified, evidently set forth before you. I think that's really interesting. So, this only what I learn of you. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by the hearing of faith? And then he uses that word again. Are you so foolish? And then he answers own, his own question. He didn't wait, of course, for a response. He answered his own question and said, Having begun in the Spirit, so that's how they began, are you now made perfect by the flesh? And there's a comment here. I'm going to pick it up. Interesting. I might have thought he meant he was crucified among them because they did not obey the truth. Be uh, that's true, yeah. So, sure, that would, have, that would make very good sense as well. So, Christ was crucified among them because they didn't obey the truth. I like that. That's a good thought. And I also know that can be substantiated by the writings of Sister White. When we reject the truth by obeying something else, then what we have done is crucified Christ afresh. So yeah, I think both are good. I like that. Thank you for sharing. So did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Are you so foolish? Having begun in the Spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh? And I think that's interesting. The reason I think that's interesting is because what we see in the writings there with um, Paul saying that you've been made perfect, or rather, you've begun in the Spirit. What does that mean? Well, remember, according to Revelation chapter 2, I believe it is, maybe 3, it says that you've lost your first works, you've, you've forgotten your first works, you've turned away from them, now you've got to go back to your first works. What are the first works? Well, think about yourself. What were the first works that happened in your life? Did you notice that God was working somehow? Did you hear maybe something that inspired you to want to learn more? Did you have somebody encourage you with words or some kind of something that helped you out and you thought, wow, God really loves me? Was your first works very simple and dealing with your mind, your understanding, your willingness to say, I want more? Now all of a sudden, the Jews, in this case, they're just not wanting more, they're just going through the regular systems of activities that rather sacrifices and services and chants and songs and those kind of things and it just doesn't seem like it's alive anymore well they've lost the spirit now they're made perfect through obedience to the law so that's how they get to god is by doing everything just so everything correctly you can't eat anything except for what is organic or what is grown by yourself maybe you you have to wear a certain type of clothes you can't say certain things in a certain way you can't you know, whatever, there's many ways that people have come to the point where they are tending toward legalism rather than just wanting to learn more. I want the Spirit of God. I want the mind of God to be in me. What more does he have to teach me? Like so, the Lamb of God. The sacrifices ended up being, and you can read this in you know, Patriarchs and Prophets or Prophets and Kings, the sacrifices just ended up becoming so monotonous and something they did regularly without even thinking or contemplating the meaning of the spotless lamb without blemish. And so they lost Christ in their multitude of business. That's what's being spoken of here as far as I can tell is they no longer were continuing in the way that they started their first works beginning in the spirit. They're now interested in perfecting everything that they know to be right because now they've got an understanding of what sanctification is if i just do everything according to as god is laying it out then i can be just what god wants me to be well that comes but it doesn't come by trying it comes by co-working with god remember we've quoted this many times philippians chapter 2 says work out your own salvation with fear and trembling because it is god that works in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. So yes, you're to work it out, but it's God that's working in you. If you're working it out without God, if you've lost sight of all the things that represent him in the first works in the spirit that's causing you to have that ability, then of course you're like the Galatians, you're foolish, you're bewitched, and it's time to go back to the first works. As it says, are you so foolish, having begun in the spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh? Notice what happens here. Beginning in the Spirit, 
perfected by the flesh. I'm going to see this comment here. Legalism. Any manner whereby one's status is measured by legal conformity or non-conformity to law. That sounds like a definition, and I'm glad for it. Thank you. That's definitely good. So, beginning in the spirit or perfected by the flesh, right? Notice what he does in just a moment here. Now, have you suffered so many things in vain or without any kind of benefit? If it's yet in vain, I'm not casting you off as though you're lost. But, I mean, have you suffered so many things as a Christian, being mocked and scourged and beaten and, you know, mistreated, cast out of the synagogue, so many of these things for no reason at all? But it's real. I mean, maybe it's not for no reason at all is what he's saying. So notice what he says here, because remember, you're beginning in the spirit and you're perfected by the flesh. Watch what happens. He therefore that ministered to you the Spirit and works miracles among you, doeth he it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? So what he's doing in these, these verses here, um, let me see, the Spirit, so you have either received the Spirit or it's the works of the law. You've begun in the Spirit or it's the flesh. Again, it's the uh, works of the law or the hearing of faith. There's actually three different verses there that kind of go through the same thought. So you receive the Spirit. Okay, that's receiving the Spirit. Or the contrary to that is works of the law. Okay, beginning in the Spirit, which is the contrary to that, which is being perfect by the flesh. Then you have, again, the um, works of the law or the contrary to that, hearing of faith. So I like what's being said here. I like what's being said here in that what we have is the spirit compared to the works, the spirit compared to the flesh. And so many times when Paul is writing in other gospels or other epistles rather, you could see that when he talks about the flesh, it could be your own works, not necessarily the carnality of what you're doing contrary to the words of God, but rather it's your going about the Christian business apart from his spirit. You're just doing it in your own strength, your own mind, your own intentions, etc. Not really praying for God's power, not submitting to his will, just going along in the motions. Have you ever met anybody like that? Do you know anybody who could potentially have this reviving again? I, I probably should be careful with that term because there's a whole ecumenical movement that's trying to revive us again. But, um, Anyways, I, I hope you understand. So now, <clears throat> going here to Vern, what, what do you have in mind, Vern? I was just thinking of this in a, you know, a context of life. Paul's asking us here, are these miracles by your faith in the one that works them? In other words, are you a conduit? Whereas the other side is, or are these miracles done because you're perfection? Right. Because many would think, and we, you know, we've all heard it, I'm sure, at times that... Uh, well, God couldn't use me because I, you know, he knows what I'm like. Right. Um, and yet, if we look at the examples of the apostles, when they were sent beginning two by two, they did many great things. And yet they said, we have this report, others are in these, Lord. Should we forbid them? They're not one of us. As if somehow their closeness to Christ's proximity physically was of a benefit, whereas, or the, or the reason they were able to do these things. And yet we know from the reports scripture they were no different than you and i they had their faults right so is it by faith that we are a conduit or is it because of our good works that god uses us amen and it, it really is um a co-working with god he wants us to be holy but there are times where out of mercy either in our situation or somebody else's situation use us in a way that is for his benefit for example balaam Balaam was not living up to God's standards. He knew it was wrong what he was doing, but God still used him to bless Israel. What about Nebuchadnezzar? Nebuchadnezzar was able to bless Daniel in such ways that, you know, and, and Belshazzar too, if I remember correctly. Anyways, Nebuchadnezzar. But uh, you can go through all sorts of stories like that and realize that God many times can use us contrary to our perfection. Look at Jonah. 
Jonah was not a perfect person, but God used him. Now, does that mean we can go on and sin without any qualms or, you know, um, convictions about how we live and what, we're our, what our choices are? Absolutely not. God is not going to allow us to live as we wish, yet still benefit heaven. Unless, of course, he's changed our hearts, then we can live as we wish, and it is in concert with his will, because our hearts will be uh, desiring what he wants. So, let me see what you've got here as a comment. And it says, I feel the same way. I am unworthy that Christ should work some profound thing through me, but he surprises me sometimes. Amen, Brian. He surprises us all. And, uh, you know, it, it is something that we can learn about. I don't know if you've known this, but when James chapter 5 talks about uh, people that are sick and they gather the elders and there's an anointing service, it's a solemn event. It is really one that is expected of us to seriously consider what's going on in our lives. But I want you to know that there's a commentary on that verse, that idea of anointing the sick. It's actually in a book called Ministry of Healing. If you've never gone through that chapter, Anointing the Sick, I believe it's what it's called. Um, I, anoint, the Anointing of the Sick or Anointing the Sick, I don't remember. Something like that, but you'll find it in there. And that chapter goes through a great description of what kind of experience God is looking for when we're praying for the anointing of the sick, somebody who would be healed as a result of the miracle that we just read about in Galatians chapter 3. Who is it that's ministering the Spirit, working miracles among you? You know, how does he do this? By the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Well, somebody is ministering the Spirit. That's really interesting because, like, you could be that somebody who's ministering the Spirit. Guess who else can minister the Spirit? Angels can minister the Spirit. Guess who else did it? Christ ministered the Spirit. What Spirit is it? The Spirit of Truth. The Spirit of Truth does not come with lies. If we are ministering the Spirit of God, it is because we are in concert with Him. And so sometimes, like I said, He uses us contrary to our uh, understanding or convictions. Sometimes He, he kind of, you know, just grabs hold of um, Ezekiel's hair and pulls him and says, You're going to Jerusalem, even though He did it in the heat of His Spirit. He was not happy about all these things. It didn't matter. God wanted Him to do that. And so there's times where God takes things into His own hands. Excuse the pun in that one. But uh, what we have is this situation where God is calling us to be those holy representatives. And how much more can he use a clean vessel compared to the one that's not? And so that's really the ideal. That's the idea that God has. So don't live like, you know, the devil and then expect that God is going to heal people based on his perfect standards through you. If it works that way and you're living like the devil and there's healings, then guess who's doing the healings, right? So, consider, the men who had attempted to lead them from their belief in the gospel were hypocrites, unholy in heart and corrupt in life. Their religion was made up of a round of ceremonies through the performance of which they expected to gain the favor of God, precisely. They had no desire for a gospel that called for obedience to the word, except a too great a sacrifice, and they clung to their errors, deceiving themselves and others. Right, thank you. That's good commentary. The, uh, here's another one. The beginning faith, a little measure is given to us. Man goes to the word of God, more faith or faith increases by hearing the word. Therefore the law is established in um, us by faith, not by works, because the Spirit drew us to the word to begin with. This is our first love, or works is of the Spirit. Yes, thank you. That's good stuff. And I definitely agree. That is what we want and need. Okay, so he therefore that ministereth to you the Spirit. Ministering to you the Spirit. Ministereth. This word here is to furnish. To fully supply. To aid or contribute. To add or to minister. To give you nourishment, right? How oh, that's really interesting. So he, which is a person, a human that ministers, that supplies, that fully supplies, that aids you with the Spirit, and He's working miracles among you. Wow, so you can actually minister the Spirit to somebody? Sure, yes. The mind of God can be channeled through you. If you are willing to serve God, He can use you in a way that 
you will be a minister of his spirit. And he's working miracles among you. Yes, I can conclude in my experience that there have been miracles that God has worked, if, if you will, through me. It has nothing to do with me. I was just a vessel, but God did the works through his vessel. So does he do it by the works of the law, which according to the Bible up here is by the flesh? Or did he do it by the hearing of faith, which up here is by the spirit? You see? So you have this really good, like, back and forth in this section in the first three, uh, five verses where you're dealing with the works of the flesh and, yes, good one, thank you, the works of the flesh or the hearing of faith, which is the working of the Spirit. Galatians 3, verse 6, Even as Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now this is a new chapter, uh, sorry, new paragraph, um, I'll read a couple more of these here, and then if anybody else is interested, they could read the chapter for themselves. In, Gal in the Galatians churches, open, unmasked error was supplanting the gospel message. Christ, the true foundation of the faith, was virtually renounced for the obsolete ceremonies of Judaism. The apostle saw that if the believers in Galatia were saved from the dangerous influences which threatened them, the most decisive measures would be taken, the sharpest warnings given. That's right, like, you know, persecution is set up, right? So um, it's a big deal. Verse 6, even, this is a new paragraph here. So the first one was basically dealing with like, okay, how did you begin? And how are those who are actually doing God's service, ministering the Spirit, doing it among you? It's not by the works of the law. It's not by the flesh. It's by the Spirit of truth living in us, right? So the Spirit is how Christ abides in us. Even as Abraham believed God. Now, Abraham, who's Abraham? He was the father of the faithful. He was the one actually before Moses, right? It was even as Abraham believed God. And it, which was his belief, was accounted to him for righteousness. Now, that's huge because the Jews at the time were saying, Now, wait a minute. We believe that God has blessed us because we're holy. We've kept his law. We've done everything in concert with the perfect obedience that we have set out to do. Like, God, hear us because we are pure and righteous, right? now. Abraham actually wasn't really that way. He didn't keep the law necessarily in his story. He simply believed that what God had said, I will make you the father of many nations. Your children will be like the stars of heaven. And all the nations of the earth will be blessed because of you. He was like, okay, that... Doesn't sound possible because I haven't had any children yet, but God, I believe you. I believe that you're able to do this. And that was accounted unto him for righteousness. That's beautiful. I love it. So going back here, know ye therefore that they which are of faith, which is, you know, continuing in the spirit as we had read in the first five verses, the same are the children of Abraham. So, okay, where does faith come from? Faith, according to the Bible, I'm going to read it to you in Romans chapter 10, verse 17. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Faith doesn't come just by looking it up in the dictionary. It comes by hearing, right? So it looks like we've uh, yeah, I read that one. This is very interesting to me because it was lack of faith in God that caused a third of the angels to fall. And now it is by faith that men can be redeemed from the face of the earth. Amen. Now, you therefore, which are of faith, which comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, the same are the children of Abraham. And so for me, this is beautiful because, again, the word of God is, is very important. Now, let's understand that the words of God are not just black on white. They're not just words. The spirit of God is not just words. Okay, I know that there have been you know, comments that make it sound like I'm teaching that the Spirit is just the words. No, absolutely not. But the, the words come from the Spirit, which is the mind of God. The mind of God is the Spirit. And I don't know how that Spirit can work the miracles, can create, can bring new life into me, can cause miracles, can command angels to do whatever, you know, he asks them to do. That Spirit, I don't know how to explain the nature and workings of that spirit. But I do know how it, how it comes, and I do know how it changes, 
And so, as a result of the words being spirit, as Christ said, it's because if we read those words and our mind is willing to be in concert with the mind of God, then what's really happening is we're receiving the actual mind or spirit of God through the words. And that's why it says that the words are living and quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword is because those words is one of God's expressions of his spirit. When we receive his words, which are an expression of his spirit, we're receiving his spirit through the channel of his words. And so, yes, there is an inseparable connection between the words and the spirit. But it's not that the words are the Holy Spirit. Okay? They're a channel of the Holy Spirit. So if that isn't clarified, please ask, and I will try to help and explain a little bit more. Vern, you are going to share, and then Mary. Two things quickly. Your last point a while back where you said you thought of Balaam, that was exactly the case that was in my mind. But yeah. The one I'm thinking of now with the faith um, is Abraham, or Abram and Sarai. Um, Abram, when he heard he was to have a child, was, in, was incredulous. And he laughed within himself. Wow, this is what's going to happen. He, he believed God's word. And yet when his wife heard similar words, uh, she laughed. But it was not sh that she was incredulous. It was, yeah, right. Um, totally different uh, attitude. And she was reproved for this. And so, you know, the, uh, the concept of by faith is what, how we view God and his willingness to do for us. Because I'm sure Abraham knew of his shortcomings, and yet he was incredulous that God was telling him at his age he was going to have a, a, a son. And uh, yet the woman couldn't take it that way. She was more the, uh, yeah, right. <laughs> How's this going to happen? I'm old and decrepit. So the same word was spirit to one and not spirit to the other, right? Amen. Yes. Amen. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, very good. Very good. Mary? I have to say, Brother Daniel, amen and amen. I'm down with you. The mystery comes in. We don't know how the spirit does it. But everything else that you're saying is crystal clear. Mm. On point. Praise God. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Praise God. We have in Galatians 3 verse 7. Know ye therefore that they which are of faith, which comes by hearing the word of God, the same are the children of Abraham. So the non-believer can read the word of God and they don't come to the point where they're transformed unless they believe it and want the will of the Father. So an atheist who's just studying the Bible to have arguments, some of them have been won. I know that's true, but many of them can leave without a transformation. In fact, it actually makes them worse because they're turning away from the truth and they're building up against, for themselves, wrath against the day of wrath. So, you know, hey, like we said earlier, the truth can be a light for some and darkness for others. But the scripture foreseeing, wait, 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 foreseeing? The scripture foresaw? Yeah. Well, what does that mean? That means to foresee or saw beforehand, right? The scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith. So what is that saying? It's saying the scripture foretold. The scripture is prophetic. Why is scripture prophetic? Because God foreknows all things. You can read that from Peter. Peter tells us that God is the one that has the foreknowledge, God the Father. So the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through what? Through faith. Where does faith come from? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, right? And so God would justify the heathen through faith. What did he do? He preached before the gospel unto Abraham. So knowing that the heathen would be justified by faith, he preached the gospel. Saying, in thee shall all nations be blessed. In who? In Abraham. And just as was mentioned, Abraham believed it. Sarah had a difficult time. So for one, the truth was beautiful. For the other, the truth was unbelievable. Uh, literally. Uh, so what we have is that the scripture foreseeing, I really liked that when I was studying this. And it, the scripture can foretell. Scripture can foresee. And if we know scripture, we also can foresee. Because it reveals prophecy. If in fact they're understood correctly. So then in verse 9, so then, they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. So those that are of faith, those that have received the word of God, which from by hearing, faith is given or received, 
they're blessed with the one who heard the words and believed. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? Abraham believed God. Believed God doing what? Believed God preaching the gospel unto Abraham. So that's where that faith comes from. He was faithful. And so this faith that Abraham was able to have, it was because he believed the words preached to him. And so I think that's really fascinating. So, they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. For as many as are of the works of the law, which is according to the first five verses, under the you know auspices of their flesh, as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. Under the curse. Now, wait a minute. Let me see. I've got a little something here I want to bring up. It's verse 10. And I'm going to find out that in Deuteronomy chapter 27, 26, it's Deuteronomy 27, verse 26, it says, Cursed be he that conformeth, or confirmeth not all the words of this law to do them. And the people shall say, Amen. So you're cursed if you don't do every single thing that's in the law. All 613 laws. You've got to do every one of them. And they're like, Amen. So, cursed is separated from God. Right. That's true. I definitely believe that. And that you can see that in Isaiah 59, verses 1 through 2 as well. So, cursed be them that do not continue in all the words of the law to do them. And that's taken from Deuteronomy 27, right? As many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. And that's where it's coming from, for it is written, Cursed is everyone that continues not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. And so I think that's really important for us to understand that if we're going to be obedient to the law and trust in our own righteousness, then we have got to be just as holy as Christ without his efforts, right? But that's impossible. Romans 2.13, For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. Right. And the way that happens is by co-working with Christ, not by doing it by when we reject Christ. You see, let me just read this. You know that you love me if you keep my commandments. Context only in relationship with Christ is the possible, or is it possible to keep the law? Absolutely. And so... Um, uh, Ryan? Yeah, I think it's frustrating because I hear these preachers um, like these, and I'm not trying to be better than they are, but it's interesting because um, this all ties in, I think, to biblical sanctification, which yes. is that God can save us from our sins, not Amen. in our sins. Amen. And God cannot save us from our sins if we don't have the spirit of Christ's righteousness, if we don't have the spirit of Christ. And we can't event. We can't have the spirit of Christ if we have the third person of the Godhead guiding us. So right. these people are trying to achieve biblical sanctification. I hear these pastors, and they're like, "We need to be perfect before the Sunday law and all this." And yet they're teaching the Trinity, and it's like they're leading people into an impossibility. It must be very frustrating. Right, and and that's absolutely true. You see, we cannot have righteousness or justification by faith with a false gospel. It's impossible. You can't have Jesus Christ saving you if it's a false Jesus. Now, if God saves you in light of your false gospel, it's out of his mercy for sure. But if you want the real righteousness, you've got to have the real Christ. If you want real justification, it's got to come from the source that gives it. And so justification by faith, when it's claimed, that the third angel's message needs to go all the way around the world, and the third angel's message is justification by faith and verity, and we as Trinitarians need to preach that gospel, it's impossible. It's not the right message. Now, God can use it in that somebody can hear truth, they can think, and they can ponder, and they can pray and study for themselves, and they can be led by God's word to the conclusions that God would have them to, but to settle on the lees of the fact that we have the truth because we're Seventh-day Adventists when we're Trinitarian, that is a very, very bad deception. I believe that what you said is right. Tibeso, would you like to share? 
Yes, thank you. Uh, it's really amazing. This afternoon here in my home, we have uh, a steady of authentication for above one and a half hour. Okay. Just uh, Christ says to his father, your word is truth and sanctify them by your truth or your word. So who sanctify us? He is the father. Yes. And on John chapter 15, verse 3, he said that you are sanctified by word that I speak unto you. Unto you. He said that. So, on chapter 17, he said to his father, sanctify them by your word. Your word is truth. On chapter 15, he said that because he connects himself as a vein and a branch and husbandman, he's a father. So, to sanctify, we have to connect ourselves to real Christ, true Christ, true Son of God, who pay all what have to be paid. Look, on chapter 17, verse 19, he says that, I am sanctified myself to them. That is how we receive sanctification of the Father through the Son. Mm -hmm. When we read uh, Act chapter 26 verse 18 chapter 26 verse 18 by faith in me Christ says that by faith in Christ Jesus we are sanctified so we have to understand through Christ through the son of God then we have to understand how we are sanctified by his word by his spirit by his mind by his character that to receive from him so that's really amazing. Amen. It is amazing. The more that you realize it all works together, the more beautiful it becomes that God is putting together like a thread, a thread of truth all the way from Genesis to Revelation. Faith, the Spirit, the, you know, the Word of God, the Son of God, the Father. It's just, they thread all the way through and it just makes so much sense. So I praise God that He's, he's leading us, and I'm thankful. So for as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse, they're separated from God, as mentioned. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that continues not in all things that are written in the law of God to do them, the book of the law. But no man is justified in the law, or by the law, in the sight of God. It is evident, for the just shall live by faith. Now, of course, you can read the verse that was taken up from Romans chapter 2 earlier and say, well, Paul is contradicting himself. No, he's not contradicting himself. What's really happening is, um, yes, I love that verse. Thank you for sharing. So this idea that God has justified us by faith, right? Um, but it says only those that do the works of the law will be justified. So you're, you're wondering like, okay, how does this work? How, what's, what's being said? If you look at the context of Romans chapter 2 and then Romans chapter 3, where it says, you know, it's a complete different concept. There's only those that do the works of the law will be justified. And by no, no works of the law will anybody be justified. You're wondering like, wait, did, does Paul even know what he's talking about? It's the context. And just the same here. It's, um, yes, the law of life in Christ, right? And... But at the same time, the context is such that in Romans chapter 2, if you have somebody that is going to be justified because they're doing the works of the law, it's in the context of judgment. Now, Romans chapter 3, it's in the context of salvation. Nobody can be justified by the works of the law in regard to salvation. You can't be justified at the onset of your walking with God because of your works. But in the judgment... You won't be justified if there are no works. So you're not saved by your works, but you're not saved without them. Now, you won't be, uh, you are saved by grace, but you're not judged by grace. You're judged by your works. So when you put all these things together, you realize like, oh, okay, so it's the context that matters when Paul is speaking. And that's why it seems that Paul is contrary to the book of James chapter 2. But he's not contrary at all. It's the context, and definitely makes perfect sense as far as I can tell. But, if, you know, I'm not the final word. But um, let's see. We have a comment here 
that says following the law in motion only is an outward expression following the law by faith is an inward expression yes saved in them not by them right the, that's the works not made righteous by the law the law can only condemn those who walk contrary to it we are made righteous by faith and faith is expressed in works right thank you good stuff so now as it reads no man is justified by the law in the sight of god it is evident because the just shall live by faith now if you look up this phrase the just shall live by faith you're like okay that's an old testament phrase right you search for those words and it comes up only three times in the new testament you're like wait a minute i thought it was in the old testament that he was quoting well he is but so if you search the just shall live by his faith is actually what it says in the old testament so if you look up that phrase then you've got the old testament statement in habakkuk chapter 2 verse 4 the just shall live by his faith so it can be a little tricky if you're searching but it is used four times in habakkuk 2 romans galatians and hebrews feel free to study that for yourself but it really is true the just those that are justified in the sight of god are going to live not by their works they're going to live by faith whose faith it's not their faith your faith will not save you it's the faith of jesus the faith of jesus in you which is the mind of christ in you is how you will be just and you will live okay so really it's it's all about christ and the salvation that comes through him i'd like to share a testimony that illustrates this chapter well at the end okay um we'll see if we have time i'm trying to finish in the next i'll be done in a few verses and then i kind of have to go because i'm at another location here too but i'll let you guys go on without me galatians 3 12 the law is not of faith so what law is not of faith and what verse is this referring to in the old testament i'm going to actually look it up real quick here this is looking at leviticus 18 verse 5 i'm going to go and we're going to see leviticus 18 verse 5 you shall therefore keep my statutes and my judgments which if a man do he shall live in them i am the lord now so if they understood the perfection of the lamb and if they understood the imperfection of their own characters they would never be able to say okay lord we can do this they should have been able to say you know what lord we can't please have mercy on us and god would have said exactly that's what i'm looking for so the law is not of faith but the man that doeth them shall live in them just as it says there in leviticus and so lord what are you trying to trick us no i want you to understand your own failures compared to my own perfection so but then of course we're proud and we want to trust that we can do it without god and then there's this whole mess of the jewish nation trying to save themselves by their own works that's a lot of what paul talks about christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law being made a curse for us for as it is written in the old testament cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree now so christ has been the one that took the curse for us and therefore from us so we don't have to hang on a tree if you will we don't have to be crucified we don't have to pay the penalty of sin why not because christ did it for us he became the curse on our behalf that the blessings of abraham might come on the gentiles through jesus christ now wait a minute god didn't he preach the gospel to abraham yes so that the blessing of abraham which was promised to him might come on the gentiles through jesus christ and jesus christ is the one that actually had the faith that matters and he's the faith that we're looking for he's the one that had that faith so that we might receive the promise of the spirit through what faith which comes by hearing and hearing by the word of god but what faith is it it's christ's faith so we have been called to receive the promise of the spirit and that promise of the spirit is not so that you can live without christ doing everything that god has required of you to do it means that you would allow christ to live in your life so that he is continuing to do what he started 
years ago. We are all as an unclean thing, and all of our righteousnesses are as filthy rags, and we all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, have taken us away. Exactly. We don't have anything to cling to. Christ was the one with the borders of his garments being blue that when they were touched brought healing. And that's really beautiful. I'll read this last verse here, and then Vern has a testimony. Brethren, I speak after the manner of men. Though it be a man's covenant, you know what, actually I'm going to stop right there because we're going to talk about that tomorrow. We're going to go into the book of Hebrews and we're going to see how this relates in that section as well. So what are we saying? I'm going to try to bring it uh, to a close here real quick and then give Vern the opportunity. Actually, Vern, why don't you share and then I'll bring it to a close. Go ahead. Yeah, I wanted to share something that happened many years ago when we first heard the Adventist faith. I've spoken of Bruce before, his wife. Um, we noticed a gentleman come in and sit at the back of the church one time, and she came to me after and she said, would you be willing to reach out to him? Turned out he was the father of one of her co-workers and the head of the uh, Portuguese community in, in Victoria, which is very large. And so I did so, and uh, we become great friends. I went to his home and studied with him many times. He had showed up in the church in a desire to test his church, which was the Pentecostal church, a sister church, the one I had come from. He had worked there in that church for 26 years as a deacon. And he was very shocked. He came to fellowship with us. And over about a seven or eight month period, he continued to come to us and not to go to them. He never received a single call. And yet he had been one of their, top, their head deacons for many years. Then he realized that uh, something was wrong with the understanding of love for the brethren. But what I wanted to share is about, I'm going to say about a year and a half later, um, I was at elders meeting Sunday morning at the pastor's home. And uh, we had, the pastor opened up a letter, uh, a request from his family who was really angry that he had started attending the Pentecostal church or the Adventist church and leaving the Pentecostal church. But they sent a letter um, requesting that we send an elder to the hospital uh, after the weekend uh, to anoint him for healing. And because this had been his request, he had asked of his family, after I have my surgery, I want you to ask of the church to send an elder to anoint me for healing. And so because I had spent time with him, the elders asked if I would go. I had no confidence in myself, but I went because of my understanding of this man and knowing uh, what the word said. You know, if, if you're sick, call upon the elders. And so I went late at night on a Tuesday night, about 10 o'clock. I went into the hospital. Everything was dark. The uh, head nurse come to me right away and she said, are you the elder? I said, I am. And she took me in. She said, spend as much time as you like. I only stayed a few minutes. Watched him for a bit, watched him the monitor. He had just come out of a, a major surgery on his heart. And so I took him by the hand and just momentarily, he opened his eyes, looked at me, smiled and disappeared back into his fog. Mm. I anointed him only there a few minutes. Um, as I said, this was Tuesday, um, Sabbath morning, I was sitting up on the podium when the, just a little bit late then the service hadn't fully started yet and the door opened and he quietly walked through straight down the aisle and sat in his customary place. Wow. You could have heard a pin drop in there <laughs> because this is not customary. This is not what happens after open heart surgery. And you know, he had this big smile on his face uh, and had a love for Christ and a word to share. And yet he was about 69, I would say at the time, 68, 69, he'd been retired for a few summers. This happened to him with major issues three times over the next 20 years. He lived well into his past now, but each time he called upon the elders, had nothing to do obviously with who was sent. And each time the Lord raised him up. Hmm. His family never did uh, reach out to become acceptive, but I'll tell you how bad it had been. They had a beautiful, kind of almost like a split home. It had an apartment in it. And after his coming to the Adventist church, he lived in one side where his wife cooked for him and she lived in the other. She wanted nothing to do with him or this after many years of marriage. Hmm. And yet in her own words, uh, as I went to, to study with him the next time, uh, the animosity was gone. She never did accept it. She never did uh, come to the Adventist church but the animosity that had been gone with the family 
had been removed by this. They obviously saw that every time their father asked of God, God heard his call. And this had not, they had not seen this where they were. They were all Pentecostals. And they had all come out of Catholicism to be Pentecostals. So, you know, it's by that word of faith. Noah was, Massa was a very simple man, didn't have a deep knowledge of scripture, but he loved the Lord. And he knew that if he called upon his Lord, according to how he was told to, didn't have any idea how it worked but he knew it would work. And each time he did so unfaithfully, each time the Lord raised him up. Amen. That's a beautiful story. And so the different ministers or elders were ministering the spirit, right? Absolutely. And, it did. and I was 35 years old at the time. I was just a young, you know, young man at the time, 33, 34 years old. Um, but I, I had a, I had more faith in his faith in God at the time. I went without any trepidation. I went expecting the Lord would do according to his will. Uh, but when I have to admit, when he walked down that aisle that day, you know, three, four days later, most men spend weeks in hospital after that. Yeah. No, he checked out. Uh, he went home. He, as far as he was concerned, the Lord had done his work uh, and he was to act accordingly. Hmm. And uh, it, it was a powerful testimony to us as, as a church, even though that Victoria church was full of many retired missionaries that had seen God work in many ways. It was a real comfort to us as a people that God was doing something that our Bible studies couldn't do. Uh, he was working in this man's faith. And, and then I realized even more after that, his continually asking me to come and share the word with him was because he found it opened the word to him. It was his faith in Christ to work through whoever uh, was a willing servant. And uh, that was a real, real encouragement to me. Amen. Praise God. Good stuff. So we, as God's servants in various different ways and capacities, are called to minister the Spirit. And uh, we do it by, as it reads in this section, it's by faith. Where does faith come from? We've got to be committed to the words of God. If we're committed to the words of God, then we have his mind, which is now in our mind, because that's how God ministers his spirit to us in many cases, is through his words. You can see that in Revelation 1 verse 1. As we know from the Father, through the Son, through the angel, through the prophet, to you and then to somebody else. That's the ministry of the Spirit, if you will, the mind of the Father. And if he calls you to work with someone to bless them, if you are called to be a servant to pray or to help somebody, like just yesterday I was driving up here to um, Limestone, Tennessee. I saw somebody pulled over on the side of the road. Well, I was on a busy freeway, but I was able to pull over you know, um, backed up for a ways, got to them, and I hopped out ready to do what I could do to help them. <clears throat> they said, oh, no, we're fine. We, we've got it. We don't need any help. Thank you so much. God bless you. And that was it. I took off. When you see an opportunity, try to minister, and you'll find that the, the doors open quite often to be able to, if you will, minister the Spirit. So it's in very different ways, many different uh, opportunities. And so I'm thankful that we can be here together and be blessed and know that God is leading us, and I'm thankful. So let's pray together, and unless somebody else has something to share, let's pray together and believe that God is continuing to do his ministry. So, amen. Thank you all for your comments. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we want to thank you that you've given us the opportunity to learn a little bit more about your holy word. Galatians chapter 3 is beautiful. Father, we don't want to be foolish Galatians. We don't want to be bewitched. We want to be led by your word. As we started out in the faith, we want to be curious. We want to be wanting more. We want to try to learn. We want to be directed by your spirit. And we want the truth of your life, your son, and your ministry to be experienced in our lives. And we pray that you'd continue to help us to come to that point where we are truly able, like was mentioned in that chapter, to minister the Spirit, whether it be through just the helping hand, the words of life, the miracles, the preaching of the Word, however it is, we want to be used. So please continue to providentially work it out so that we can, each of us, minister to somebody somehow as soon as possible. We thank you for this and pray again for the blessings of everybody here. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.